speaker. And Cassidy is the daughter of our guest speaker. Take as much risk as men. 
We struggle to bounce back from failure. And when women don't succeed, face it, we take it personally. How many of you have heard of a lady named Sarah Blakely? Sarah Blakely. Well, yeah, I heard it. She started actually doing door-to-door -door sales, and she would sell fax machines of all things. And one day, she was, I think, going to a party, and she just she realized that she didn't have the right undergarments on. So she wanted to provide a smooth look under her white pants. And so what did she do? Armed with a pair of scissors, she cut the feet off of her controlled top pantyhose. And voila, Spanx was born. <laughs> Last night, my girls and I went to Dillard's, and, and I said, I want to look for Spanx. And they said, what's Spanx? So now they know what Spanx is. It's in Dillard's, guys. <laughs> Today, Sarah is a billionaire, an American billionaire. She's a founder of Spanx, and she's listed as the top 100 most influential people by Time Magazine. She's also listed as the top 100 most powerful women in the world by Forbes. And recently they did an interview with her. They asked her, you know, what's, what's the secret to your success? What do you attribute your success to? And she says that she can trace her success from her dad. She says that her dad taught her an important, important lesson about failure. Her dad, at dinner, every evening, would sit her with her brother and her, and he would ask them one question. The question was, what have you done this week? How have you failed this week? What have you done to fail? And I think at first they were really taken aback by that. And every day he would ask the same question. What have you failed at this week? What have you failed at today? And you know, he would celebrate. She said that he would celebrate their efforts and, they, and reframe their definition of failure. He encouraged them to write down the hidden gifts that, that was in those failures and what they got out of it. And as they did this, they realized that in everything, there was an amazing nugget that they could learn. It encouraged them that they could learn from their mistakes. And really, the failure was not trying, not the outcome. So how do we define our fear of failure? How do we redefine it? Well, we can redefine it by starting to find value, value in our shortcomings. We can redefine our, our fear of failure by recognizing and celebrating our achievement and our resiliency. We can redefine fear by challenging ourselves to persevere despite in, in spite our initial failures. And we can remember the wise words of Mr. K. We will miss 100% of the shots that we don't take. And we have to understand that failure is necessary sometimes. It's a precursor to success. That's how we redefine our fear of failure as women. Letter E. E is fear of external forces. Sometimes, I don't know if everyone's like me, but sometimes I have this thing where if I could just gain control of people, or if I could just gain control of a situation, everything would be okay. I could prevent forest fires. I can prevent the bad things that happen. If, if only I would, was there, that would not have happened. How many of you are like that? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm like that. It was the fall of 2006. It was early morning, around 1 a.m. in the morning. And I sat there. I was sitting in a chair in a hospital room. I had this warm blanket around me, given to me by a kind uh, nurse that was there that night. And I just sat there, and I, I was watching my mom. She was struggling through the night. And as I sat there and looked at her, you know, I was starting to think, my, my brothers and I and my sister took turns taking care of my mom. We wanted to make sure that she was never alone during her time at the hospital. But as I looked at her, I just became extremely, it was just really extremely difficult for me to, to watch her go through this. And here was my mom. She worked two jobs almost all my life. She was always so strong mentally and physically. And seeing her struggle with something that the physicians couldn't explain or that they did, 
understand themselves was real hard for me. I had a lot of fears. I was afraid of losing my mom. I felt like I wasn't ready to lose my mom. I was only 38. And I just told myself I'm not ready. I said, hey, for one thing, she hasn't even written down all her recipes for me. She can't die. <laughs> what about her grandkids? She hasn't seen them graduate. And um, I started to get real angry. I, I, I looked at her and I said, if she had only taken better care of herself, if she ate right, if she exercised, and if she just listened to her doctors, I was, I was looking at her and I said, you know, I'm the compliance officer at YRMC. The compliance officer. Compliance is my middle name. <laughs> and here's my mom, the most non-compliant person in the world. Doesn't listen to her docs. Doesn't take her meds when she's supposed to. Non-compliance. Like, how could I be related to her? <laughs> and then I started thinking if, if I lived, she lived, you know, we, I was in Hawaii and um, lived there all her life. And, I said, if I had just been home, you know, I've lived, if I lived closer to home, if I just helped her with her regimens, if I, maybe if I took her to her appointments and cooked her food and monitored her medications, and if I took her on walks and made sure she exercised and did yoga every day, maybe, just maybe, if I could control her every waking moment, <laughs> she would not be in this situation. I wouldn't be in this, in this hospital room. If I could just control her, she hated it, hated it when we told her, Mom, what are you eating? You shouldn't be eating that. She hated that. But if I could have just controlled that, things would not have been this bad. Those thoughts lingered in my head, and it bothered me the rest of that, that day. And it was interesting because it felt like that evening when my mom and I were talking, it felt like she knew what I was thinking. My mom said to me, I lived a fulfilled life. I've lived a good life. I've been able to see all my kids finish school. Your dad and I, we do as we please. I've been able to do all the things that I've wanted to in life, and I'm right with God. And he has granted me my greatest wishes and my greatest dreams. I'm content. It's as if she was trying to tell me, Maria, stop being a control freak. <laughs> Stop trying to control what you don't have control over. It was a gentle reminder to me that oftentimes there are external forces, the E, external forces outside of our span of control that we have nothing, we can't do anything about. So how do we redefine this fear? How do we redefine the fear and, and, and ensure that it doesn't cripple us from living life? So what if we retrain our thoughts? What if we say, I can't perform, I, I, I can't prevent a natural disaster, but I can prepare for it. I can't guarantee that I won't develop cancer, but I can choose to live a healthy lifestyle. And early screenings, shout out to mammograms and everything we do from a screening perspective at YMC. I can't control how somebody behaves but I can control my actions. I can't control a loved one's life choices. I just can't. But I can love them and cherish my times with them. And girls, I can't make you get a GPA of 4.0. <laughs> but I can give you all the tools that you will need to get good grades. And I can't control the rain, so I'm gonna bring an umbrella. This is how we redefine our fear of external forces. A, fear of being alone. Growing up with, with six, you know, there's my five siblings and I, there's six of us growing up in the house, and our house was always so loud and always noisy and full of activity and you know just things going on all the time. And when I, when I went away to college, I had my own apartment and it felt kind of weird. Like it was really lonely and, and Quiet. And so I would do things like turn on the TV and put on music and you know, do all these things just so that I could have this, this noise because it felt comforting. And I just didn't like the quiet. I, I didn't like the feeling of being alone. Uh, there's a recent survey that says one third of women are more afraid of loneliness than a diagnosis of cancer. 
they did a research at you know, University of Toronto, and they say that people are willing to stay in relationships even if they're unhappy and are more willing to date people who they know are not good for them because women are afraid of being alone. I did a search on Amazon the other day. I put women, loneliness, books. And man, lo and behold, there's tons and tons of books on the topic. Living alone and loving it. The art of being alone. How to overcome loneliness and fear of being alone while learning to love yourself. Soulmate, master of art of aloneness and trans will transform your life. Single, the art of being satisfied, fulfilled, and independent. Alone and content, inspiring essays to help divorced and widowed women feel whole and complete. And it kept going on and on and on. I, I uh, read this article about this Japanese soldier from World War II. Uh, he was an intelligence officer uh, from the Imperial Army. And it was 1944, he was sent to this small island in the Philippines to spy on the US forces. And then in the latter stage of the war, the Allied forces obviously defeat the Japanese. However, most of the Japanese troops, you know, they left the islands, they withdrew, they surrendered and whatnot. But this one man, he hid in the jungles, dismissing any messages saying that the war was over. For 29 years, he survived on food that he gathered in the jungle. And he eventually was persuaded to come out of hiding in 1974. Talk about being alone 21 <laughs> years on an island. So how do we redefine our fear of being alone? Well, one, I think it's embracing alone time to recharge, to gain perspective, and enhance creativity. I got three girls. When I come home and I just want to take a shower for five minutes, and hear, mom, 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 mom. It's like, I just need five minutes. Five in the shower. So alone time, you can have, it's not that bad. Allows us to recharge, gain perspective, enhance our creativity. Number two, stop tolerating unhappy relationships. Three, go out and meet people. And four, help others live a, life of, live a life of service. Only a life lived in service of others is worth living. And this is five. Ladies, this is for real. Facebook is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so R, fear of rejection and retaliation. You know, YMC, we, we promote a total healing environment, first and foremost, for the patients that we have the privilege of serving. Whether it's seeing women come into our facilities with signs of you know, domestic abuse or abuse of, of any sort, um, or personally coming into contact with family members, neighbors, or friends who may be a victim of, of domestic violence. It hurts our entire community. I wasn't aware until just recently learning some st startling statistics. It says one out of three women in the US have experienced some form of phys physical violence by an intimate partner. An average of 24 people per minute are victims of rape, violence, or stalking. That's 12 million people a year in the US. And nearly 8 million days of paid work each year is lost due to domestic violence issues. The EEOC says 96% of domestic violence victims are who are employed experience problems at work due to the abuse. And let's talk about sexual harassment. I mean, that's all over the news right now, right? But it says one out of four women have been on the receiving end of sexual harassment. And then 75% of women who experience workplace harassment experience retaliation when they spoke up. And then what about facing rejection or retaliation simply by doing the right thing? Standing up to a bully at school? Standing up for a friend? At YMC, our compliance program, one of the things that we, we help to promote and foster is a, a culture where people are, or employees are um, encouraged to speak up and that any concerns that are brought up are brought up without the fear of retaliation. So interestingly enough, I have this friend. Um, I'm not gonna name her, but she is in this room, Mary. Oops, I said her name. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary, she is so adventurous. She like does all kinds of crazy things, like go to Antarctica. Right, so she went to Antarctica, I think last year, and um, she came back and she was so excited. She's like, guys, during our lunch hour, bring your own bag sack lunch and we're gonna go into the conference room and I'm gonna show you guys pictures of Antarctica. 
And penguins. She loves penguins. <laughs> Show us like gazillion pictures of penguins. So anyway, we're here, here it's been, I don't know, how many do you think, 30? 30 people? We're in this room, we have our snack lunches, we're eating, and she's showing us these pictures, and then finally she's done with her slideshow, and we're all in awe of Huck the Beauty, right? And then she says, okay guys, I have something to share with you. But first of all, you need to promise that you will not report me. You have to promise that you will not put this on Facebook. You have to promise that whatever is said here, you're not gonna say anything. Now you're gonna be in trouble. So of course, we're all, you know, the compliance officer's there, we have the HR person there, we got finance people there, and she's telling us this right here, I'm eating my peanut butter jelly sandwich, like what's gonna happen? So then she says, I brought something back, and I, I, I'm not supposed to, it's against the law, right? And she says, it's a penguin egg. We're like, penguin egg. And she goes, I'm, I'm gonna pass it around, but be very careful. Be very careful, but I'm gonna pass it around for all of you to see. So she does, she brings out this little basket with this egg in it, and she's passing it around, and we're looking at it, and I'm like, I can't believe she has a, does she smuggle a penguin egg? <laughs> like, what port did she come? And it's like, how did you do it? You know, so she's going along, telling her story, blah, blah, blah. Passing around, some people buy me, they're like, it's so small. And then another one's like, oh, it's an abandoned egg. It's like, oh, okay, that's why it's so small. So, you know, she's passing this around. <laughs> Nobody says anything, all right? They're just, you know, to ourselves. And then one brave soul raises her hand and she says, Mary, how do you know it was abandoned? How, how, how did, why did you pick it up? How did you? And Mary says her thing, it was an abandoned egg, don't worry about it. All of us are, you know, kind of going our way. And, and she raises her hand again and she's like, what? But that's wrong. You know, how do you know it was abandoned? And finally it was way too much. You know, it was like, everybody was just like, oh, this is gonna be a little bit awkward. At the end of the day, it wasn't a real penguin egg. Mary was telling a joke, it was from a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> she got us all going. <laughs> But it actually reminded me that if with 40, 30, 30 people there, nobody said a word except our brave finance, the soul, the soul of a private or um, finance person who, who raised the question. It's amazing that even amongst our friends, sometimes we're hesitant to speak up because we're afraid of being rejected or being retaliated against. I knew it was wrong, Mary, when they first said it was illegal. <laughs> I, I didn't say anything, I just kept eating my peanut butter jelly sandwich. If you know of someone who's experiencing rejection or retaliation, make time for them. Listen without judgment. Acknowledge that it's not their fault, whatever it is that they're going through. Validate their feelings and offer specific help. Right words spoken at the right time can be incredibly healing. And we can redefine our fear of rejection and retaliation by providing healing words. You know, I forget a lot of things. You can ask the two ladies that I work with. I'm always like, can you remind me again? What happened? Can you remind me? And so they're constantly trying to remind me. But I might forget a lot of things in life, but I will never forget people who are genuinely kind. We just don't. Those who helped us along the way when we were hurt, or have loved us when we're unlovable. So be that voice for others. You are the voice that can heal and your voice can save. And if you are a victim of abuse or rejection or retaliation, remember that silence is self-abuse. Give yourself permission to openly communicate what matters to you to a safe person. So compliance, people say, well, what is compliance? You know, it's, it's really all about doing the right thing doing the right thing for our patients at YMC, it's doing the right thing for each other and doing the right thing for the communities that we serve. It means to speak up, to stand up and do what's right. So I have this, this short parable here. It's, um, I'm gonna read it. It says, fear is man's greatest adversary. According to an ancient legend, a man driving one day to Constantinople was stopped by an old woman who asked him for a ride. 
She took her up beside him, and, and as they drove along, he looked at her and became frightened and asked her, who are you? The old woman replied, I'm cholera. Thereupon, the peasant ordered the old woman, get down and walk. But she persuaded him to take her along upon a promise that she would not kill more than five people at Constantinople. As a pledge of the promise, she handed him a dagger, saying to him that it was the only weapon with which she could be killed. Then she added, I shall meet you in two days, and if I break my promise to you, you may stab me. So, in Constantinople, 120 people died of cholera. This enraged the man, and he, who had driven to the city with this woman, who had given the dagger as a pledge that she would not kill more than five, he started to go out and look for her. Look for this old woman, and then when he met her, he raised his dagger to kill her. But she stopped him and said, I have kept my agreement. I've only killed five. Fear killed the others. Our, we need to redefine our fears. It is critical for us women. We can redefine fear by turning it into courage. And I love this story. It's about an 81-year-old woman, a, a lady that lives on her own. And one day her son was visiting her. They were just talking. And then she proceeded to tell him that she, that night before, had suspected a burglar in her bedroom closet. And so the man said, Mom, why didn't you call me? I only live 10 minutes away. And she says, well, I sat there in my bed. I was getting ready to, to go to sleep, and I heard this noise. And I, I had a decision to make. I could either be paralyzed with fear the whole night until morning came, and I could call you, or I could do something about it. And I, 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 the, something to do about it, that, that meant not calling you, because it was too late. I didn't want to bother you. But I started to think, sit in bed, be paralyzed with fear, or do something about it. So she says, I'm going to get up and do something about it. So she gets up, goes into her kitchen, she grabs some hammer and some nails, gets back into her room, and hammers the door shut. And then she says, she slept soundly like a baby. Are you a single woman or a single mom who's apprehensive about finishing a degree or pursuing a degree? Are you a woman who's trying to pursue advancement in your career, and maybe you're afraid to do it? Are you a working mother who's trying to balance juggling your career, your family, your home life, your exercising, career, your kids, and fear that you're going to drop the ball? Are you a business owner who's afraid to take the next steps in your business <coughs> to get your business to the next level? Are you a, a, little, a little lady, one of our kids, who are just starting out in life, and you're afraid of dreaming big dreams? Or are you a woman who's nearing retirement and fearful of the future? We, we need to have the courage to nail our fear shut. We need to not allow fear to dictate our lives. Are we gonna allow fear to whisper doubts in our ears? Are we gonna allow fear to shape our future? Or instead, Will we face fear with courage? Will we have the courage to redefine our fears? You know, Henry Ford says, one of the biggest discoveries a man, or I should say a woman, let's do this, one of the greatest discoveries a woman <coughs> makes, one of her greatest surprises, is to find out that she can, she can do what she was afraid she couldn't do. Wishing you all of God's richest blessings, and thank you again for having me today.